welcome all of you. My name is Maria Konzielska and this is Polan Daily Culture. If you are fans of Big Red of Art, then this episode is specially dedicated for you because we have a young artist here with us, Mangosia Maninoska. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And uh, looking at the perspective of modern art, I would say there are two waves of there are a lot of people who focus on everything what is conceptual and going in many weird directions from uh, uh, from just shapes uh, to buildings to some installation other things and there are the more traditional uh, paintings which of course is figurative art uh, and you you belong to the to the group of oil and figures and you're especially interested in the faces of people Tell us uh, why them, why faces, what is uh, so, uh, what intrigues you so much in them? Fair enough. I, I've been thinking about that lately because at first I was not aware why do I have such a need to paint people, but then finally, and I would have some commissions like, would you like to do a landscape? I could, but my heart is not there. So I kind of had to think why is so. I know what it is about. So basically, me especially, an artist, a painter, and my technique, especially my practice, is hours, hours of a lonely work. So I would sit down and it's 10 hours later when I can finally decide that my day is, that my, that my day is done. And I, I found out that during those lonely hours, you're basically by yourself. So I guess I paint people to have somebody to talk to. So <laughs> they, they become, they That's become my friends. That's very funny. Well, the, the most funny thing I've ever heard from artists. So I, <laughs> I paint people to have friends to talk to. Yes, but that, that is true, really. When you know, when you paint a landscape for hours, it's like uh, you you become a bit depressed. You know. You, you, yeah, it can be. It can be. And it, then it becomes least... empty. And when I do my when I paint my people, and at first they they're just a sketch. There's a draft, but later on I add this, I add that, and then I get very attached to them. I talk to them, and later on there's a there is a tragedy of selling them. Some of my pieces I can't let them go. And <laughs> the, yes, the best I guess for a buyer, the best approach is to grab them uh, fresh when they just finish. So I don't build another attachment by having them at my home. Then it's just it's a disaster for me to let them go. I see. So you basically find uh, your uh, the paintings and the characters at the paintings uh, alive, alone. Yes, I think, and there's they're they're in a different space. They are neither alive nor dead. They are from a different dimension. Oh, I see. And in my opinion, that makes them very interesting. Although you kind of have to devote some time and attention to see it, but I have had people telling me that that's that's exactly what they see: the the presence of those uh, people, of those persons, become very visible to a viewer after a while as well. Well, especially. definitely, looking at your paintings, uh, one has this experience that like uh, the world, which they are definitely part of it, and we just see the window of it. Exactly, so I, I, that's a nice way of putting it. They are in their own world. I have a glimpse of the world on a daily basis, and I decide which window I would choose for my future project, my future painting. And then a buyer or a, you know, a collector can uh, become a part of that world in this very little so, space uh, of one knowing painting. Knowing this thing about you and the fact that you were painting those little children from the Holocaust time, those who died during the Holocaust or previous to world. So you kind of gave them a window to, to the modern world, uh, but uh, the where, where did you have a, like an experience that they, for example, wanted to be back to life or want to crave to be alive and kind of stealing a little bit of your energy and, li and uh, life? Yes, there's a big story behind it because uh, for me personally, growing back in Warsaw was a bit, was a bit, I don't know, like a ghostly town. My, my grandmother would tell me stories about the war and I was very, as a child, I was very disappointed that we went through that and I would see ghosts of people all around me. 
And then later on, I discovered that I do have some Jewish roots from my father's side, who would never talk about that. And that was also surprising for me. And then, you know, seeing some pictures of people from before the war, like ghost people that inspired yeah, my memory. <laughs> And especially children, they were like, so, for example, when you see pictures of children, especially Jewish children, but they don't have to be Jewish children from before the war, you you ask a question whether they're going to survive those yes, terrible times. And Did you, Warsaw is full of them. I fully agree that you are... Uh, so you knew that what their story were, like when you were painting the pictures from the photo, like looking at the photos, uh, the uh, were you aware of the story, like did those people survive or didn't survive, or where did they die? The first, because you're talking about my project called The Lost Generation, and the, f the first part of that project was focused on uh, mainly on uh, photographs made by Roman Wisniak. He was a journalist, uh, a photographer going around Eastern Europe uh, depicting Jewish life from before the war and then the war break out, but his photographs survived and they're very touching and inspiring and also sad. Uh, but later on, uh, I would uh, develop this uh, approach that I would focus on a particular picture found uh, among archives in Yad Vashem, they are online, uh, of people who had the story behind them, whether they survived or they did not. I, I would know that and that yes. would that would make them appeal in my paintings. Uh, is it, was it like as any special audience who were buying those pictures? Jewish people mainly. Okay. In yeah. New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically you found your niche <laughs> that, uh, and you had a group of people who wanted those pictures. Yes, and I think they are very touching and hunting. I really like them. I, it was a great experience to be a part of them, to, be, to, be, to, to live with them. But that went for years, and after a while, it kind of went to my head. As I said in the first episode, I had to move to something more cheerful. Yes, and now you have the Lolita project. Exactly. And fingers crossed for another project, more cheerful, cheerful and full of energy. Thank you. Because... That's needed for nowadays world. Absolutely, especially in pandemic. So to all of you, the viewers of Perlon Daily, as you can see, uh, Margusha Malinowska is, has many of her sides, sad and happy. And now she's going for a uh, more happier direction. So if you maybe are interested in any of her paintings, on um, calling her, mastering her, trying to find her on the internet, uh, then definitely do this. And of course, stay with us and watch Perlon Daily Culture. <music>